So this will be part 12 of passing your uh, helicopter check ride in a Robinson R44. And we're going to start off by talking a little bit about uh, rotors and the different rotor designs. Uh, <clears throat> you're going to be flying an R44 for your check ride, so you're flying a semi-rigid rotor system. And one of the main questions uh, that they want answered uh, concerning a semi-rigid rotor system is what is the Achilles heel or the downfall of a semi-rigid rotor system? And that would be mass bumping. All right. And the next question there likely leads to is, okay, uh, as far as mass bumping is concerned, what causes mass bumping? And the answer is, the pilot causes mass bumping. Right? Next question, what inappropriate actions by the pilot lead to mass bumping? And then that starts off with, uh, you should be able to explain in relatively short order what causes mass bumping. And the shortest description for mass bumping ought to go something like this. No, under the normal situation where the, th where the rotor is producing thrust, it's lifting up, it's producing a lifting uh, moment on the uh, helicopter, and we're basically a pendulum hanging from one boat by this, by this rotor. And as long as the rotor is producing thrust, then the rotor is commanding the fuselage. Wherever the rotor goes, the fuselage is going to follow. Right? What happens in mass bumping is the first thing is the pilot unloads the rotor. So let's talk about disc loading real quick, or loading and unloading the rotor. When you, if you were to fly along and you come relatively aggressively back on the disc, on the stick rather, the angle of attack of the rotor disc increases, the amount of lift increases, and the aircraft goes up. Right? If you come, when you come forward on the, on the stick, the angle of attack of the rotor disc decreases, the amount of lift decreases, and the aircraft goes down. If that was taken to relatively extreme or fairly aggressively forward on the stick, you can, you can bring the stick forward fast enough where the rotor thrust essentially goes to essentially zero, or near zero. When that happens now, the rotor is no longer commanding the fuselage. In other words, it's not, uh, the fuselage is not having to be pulled forward by the fuselage. Also when that happens, if you think about it, you'd have to have some semblance of nose down or nose low. Well, when that happens now, your tail rotor is up here above the CG of the aircraft. Right? It's still producing thrust. Right? It's still pushing that direction. Right? So what happens is that you, as a pilot, pushes over and unloads, <clears throat> excuse me, unloads the rotor disc then that puts the tail rotor above the CG and we can see where it's, where it's at up here, it's going to have a, a moment, a rolling moment will be caused to the fuselage and that's what gets you in trouble, alright? So you push over and unload the rotor, C the CG is uh, uh, below the tail rotor, tail rotor causes a, a right rolling moment and you exceed the flapping limits designed for the aircraft. And again, most helicopters only have between 10 and 12 degrees of uh, flapping design allowed into the design. So you push over, gets low, you get a rope, you get a slight left yaw, but a right roll. And that, that causes the blades to come around, uh, flap excessively, come around, chop off the tail boom, and another few uh, revolutions then the, the mass will snap in two. And you'll literally be three parts coming out of the sky. That leaves a signature at the crash site that's easily easily seen and what happens is the blades come around they chop off the tail boom tail boom falls to the ground it's usually relatively intact from the part where it was chopped off at the fuselage uh, you know then the rotor snaps off the fuselage will come nearly straight down to the ground it usually burns because of fuel rupture and so there's usually a post crash fire where the main part of the fuselage is contained and then the rotor after that snaps off will typically sort of fly forward a bit and is found some distance from the fuselage, usually in, sort of in the direction of flight most time. And that's a typical signature for mass bumping, and that's why when you see that at a crash site, you know that the pilot uh, mass bumped the aircraft. So again, in review, the question is going to come up, what causes mass bumping? And the answer is the pilot causes mass bumping. All right. Next question again will be what inappropriate actions by the pilot led to mass bumping? And it all started off with aggressively, relatively aggressively unloading the rotor. So the next question that he's going to pose is likely going to be, okay, so you're flying the aircraft and for whatever reason you dropped your cell phone, you reached over to get it or whatever, you came relatively forward on the, on the stick and you think that you're kind of hanging from the seat belt and 
<clears throat> you think that you've unloaded a rotor, may even have a slight right roll uh, starting, how are you supposed to respond? And you gotta get this one right or you're gonna die. <laughs> right? And the response is first load the rotor. Come gently back, you know, not aggressively back with the stick, but come gently back with the stick to reload the rotor and then correct for any right roll. If you unload the rotor and you get a right roll and you try to correct it with left stick, all you've done is sealed your fate because the aircraft will start with that right roll and when you put in a left put for, uh, put in an input for left, left stick, it's just gonna make the problem worse. It's gonna flap even farther and seal your fate. So remember, the recovery, if you think you're in a low G situation, is to first gently and, and smoothly bring the uh, stick back and reload the rotor, then correct for any roll. So the next rotor system that we're going to look at is the fully articulated rotor system. And most of your uh, early helicopters were all fully articulated design. Um, and <clears throat> the specific question he's going to want to know is, again, what's the Achilles heel of the full, uh, fully articulated system? In other words, what can it get into that the other two systems can't? And the answer is ground resonance. All right, so then that opens the door for several questions on ground resonance. Number one, he's going to ask you, you know, when can ground resonance occur? And there's two times that ground resonance can occur, can occur rather, and it's during landing and during startup as you're accelerating the blades and spinning up the blades. So let's look at landing first. If you come in and you, if you notice that all fully articulated uh, helicopters have uh, shock absorbers on the, um, on the corners of the skids, all four corners of the skids, and that's to help prevent the ability to transmit a hard bump up to the rotor blades. Uh, during a landing if you were to land hard. So if you were to land hard and touch down with a pretty good thump, you can actually, if you had a bad, you know, one of the shock absorbers on the uh, skids was not working or if you hit hard enough, you can transmit a uh, hard bump up to the main rotor system. And what happens is the blade that's lowest in rotation will actually lag more than the other two. And so now you've got a problem because the blades, let's say you got a three blade system, all three blades are not exactly 120 degrees apart. So when you, the normal situation is you have three blades that are exactly 120 degrees apart, and so the CG of those three blades is located right over the mast, all right? So as the blades rotate, the CG is, is in one spot, and that being located right over the top of the mast. The problem when one of those blades gets out of phase or something less than or more than 120 degrees, and that throws the CG off, and the CG of the blades is no longer ro rotating uh, right over the top of the mast, it's out here and that CG is going around, your CG is changing equal to whatever your blade RPM is. And that is enough to literally tear the aircraft apart within just a matter of one to three seconds. You're gonna have parts start flying off that thing. So, so if it happens during landing, what do you do? Well, the answer is you pick the aircraft back up as quickly as you can. Because once you get it back into the air, all three blades are gonna go out to 120 degrees apart and stop the resonance, all right? If it remains intact with the ground, then the resonance will continue until the aircraft literally eats itself apart. And there's a lot of videos you can look for any of those, just type in helicopter ground resonance on YouTube and you'll find several videos showing an example of that. Okay, the second uh, time that ground resonance can occur is if the aircraft is sitting on the ground and during the, during the startup. As the blades are accelerating, uh, if you'll notice, if you look at say a Schweitzer or any of Hughes, anyway, they all have dampener cans that act, act as a shock absorber so that the aircraft, so one of the things you're taught when you go out and you pre-flight a fully articulated rotor system is you actually grab the end of the rotor blade and pull it back and forth, all three blades, to see if the dampeners are, are equal. Make sure you don't have a weak dampener on one of the blades because if you had a weak dampener, if you had a dampener failure, it wasn't doing much. During acceleration, as the blades speed up, then that, that blade that has a weak dampener is gonna lag more than the other two, and again, get out of phase, not be exactly 120 degrees apart from each other, and the aircraft, again, will literally eat itself apart in short order, all right? So now, what do you do if you're starting up the aircraft? What do you do to try to stop it if ground resonance begins? And I can tell you right now, it's pretty much a done deal, but, well, and what you do is you pull the mixture. Pull the mixture or uh, shut off the fuel flow. You know, you're always taught in a fully articulated rotor system during the startup, you keep your hand on the mixture, right? And the reason you're keeping your hand on that mixture is in case it gets into resonance during startup, you can pull the mixture and hopefully the thing uh, slows down uh, before it starts throwing uh, parts off. 
So again, during the startup, keep your hand on the mixture. If you think you're getting into ground resonance, pull the mixture as quickly as you can. If you were wrong and it slows down and all, whatever, you just restart the aircraft again. Okay, so two times. Number one, during landing, and you may have noticed that all the fully articulated rotor systems, uh, again, have the shock absorbers on the, the uh, all four corners of the skids. And one of the another thing that you're taught on pre-flight is to check those skids and make sure that they're not leaking. If you had a one of those again shock absorbers on one of the corners that that is not functioning correctly, then that can provide the impetus to get into ground resonance during a uh, landing. So another thing that needs uh, sort of bears mentioning here about ground resonance, and that's, uh, <clears throat> and this is during the landing, if you did a run on landing over a, a rough surface, you can get enough rocking back and forth with the uh, blades to actually induce ground resonance. Um, the only time I'd, I've ever really got into ground resonance and saved it was actually on a runway. And this runway was a paved runway, but <clears throat> you know, sometimes paved runways, if they have large airplanes that are come down and sit down, sit down on the runway relatively uh, frequently, you can get some buckling to the asphalt where it gets kind of a washboard uh, uh, near where the uh, planes uh, actually sit down on. And I was doing a run on landing, just demonstrating a run on landing one time and sliding across in a Schweitzer and the thing started getting into resonance. So it's quite simple. You just pull back up on the collective and get the thing back in the air and it stops. But the same thing can happen uh, on rough pavement, you know, if it's kind of this washboard-like pavement that occurs near where the airplane sometimes touch down at, or if on the, over the ground, if the ground is rough enough. So just be aware of that if you're doing a run-on landing with a fully articulated rotor system, you know, watch for ground resonance and be, be uh, prepared to lift the aircraft quickly back up uh, to save it and you both, so. And finally, the last uh, rotor system that we're going to look at is a rigid rotor system. And the rigid rotor system is just that, rigid. It has a, usually a solid hub, and incidentally how they manufacture those hubs, they usually CNC the hub out of one solid piece of magnesium. <clears throat> and the blades uh, that are on the, fuller, I'm sorry, on the uh, uh, rigid rotor system are always composite. All right? And the reason being is because it has a rigid hub, so and it doesn't have any hinges there. There's no hinges to, to, uh, to for flapping hinges. So the flapping occurs within the blade itself. In other words, the blade deforms and flaps up and down. And uh, so it has to be a composite material. You know, if it was metal and it was flapping up and down like that, generally you'd have problems with metal fatigue. But composite systems are, uh, you know, able to withstand uh, constant flexing like that. So what is the Achilles heel of the rigid rotor system? And the answer is it's hellaciously expensive. <laughs> the composite blades are expensive, and uh, so overall it just costs a lot more uh, to uh, to fly. So you don't see them very often. There's a few of them. The you know the Red Bull helicopter, the uh, the uh, 105. I used to fly around in a 105 and pick up patients, and uh, I always thought they had kind of a little bit of a, a weird ride to them. But uh, anyway, the uh, uh, you're not see, you don't see it used often um, because of the expense associated with it. Okay, so that does it for part 12, and uh, we'll continue this uh, on part 13. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next video.